Have you ever been followed? Well, gee, Sean, that, you might want to define that a little bit. There's following in a good way. And then there's following in a frustrating way. And then there's being followed in an icky and creepy way. And then there's being followed in a dangerous way. I'm not sure I'm talking about any of those things. What I have in my mind is when we're in conflict with someone else, maybe you're like, Sean, I came to church to be encouraged. Why are you bringing this up? Because I am here to exercise my spiritual gift of provocation, so I'm going to provoke you this morning. No. Um, have you ever noticed when you're in conflict with somebody that you want to get away from that person? Right? And the way in which we get away has something to do with whether or not we will be followed. By that I mean this. I've had some relationships, some fractures and broken relationships that I wanted to get out of. And in the fracturing, I had a variety of emotions. I was hurt. I was angry, um, vindictive. You know, like, how did you become a pastor? I don't know. I know. I, but I've had, you know, when we go through breaks in relationships, it causes real emotion. And for me, I found that when I just couldn't wait to get out of the relationship, I realized sometime later I still had some work to do. Because maybe not the relationship, but the issues followed me. And I didn't want to be followed by those issues. I just wanted to get away. A couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I, I invited you as a church because we as a church were invited by our leadership, both our superintendent, Rob Roy Ranger, and our bishops who oversee hundreds of churches, invited the larger church of the Free Methodist into a, a time of fasting. And so we've been fasting. And I've gone through a couple of significant times of fasting in my life that I thought I started the fasting with one goal in mind, and it was this, what's next? In both of those cases, I was wondering if I should leave where I was at, the work that I was doing that we were involved with, to, to take a, a start a new chapter in our life. And I found that the Lord wanted to speak to me and speak to Diane and I, but I'm, I'm personalizing this. And I found that directions were not the thing that was number one on the Lord's mind to speak to me about. It was relationships. In one case, I was, um, in, bo in both cases, we were pastoring and we'd come into some conflict. If you've been in the church long enough, you know that the church is not perfect, uh, not always comfortable, and at times, because it has, what, what's the word I'm looking for, humans, it has humans in it, we find ourselves in conflict with one another for all sorts of reasons. Well, I was in conflict, and I started running. I don't look like a runner. My knees would tell you I'm not a runner. But I started running. And I didn't realize it at first, but I, I realized later I was running because I had a lot of pent-up emotions, all sorts of emotions. And we were praying about, Lord, is, is this a time that we were supposed to move on? And I was in conflict with some, some of my best friends. You ever had that? Why is it friends and family 
are so often the ones we're in conflict with. And I was running, and I remember one day I was out running on a long run. I think I, think I was like a 10-mile run. And I, can I just say I've learned my lesson? If you've got 10 miles to go, just drive. <laughs> Uber, anything. Like, I was running 10 miles. And I was not expecting to hear God speak to me. By the, I just want to pause for a moment because I've used a phrase that can so often be misunderstood. God spoke to you. I did not hear an audible sound. I, I didn't hear an audible voice. But what I mean is I had a thought. I'm just out there running. And by the way, I sweat. I can sweat when I think about running. So when I was actually running, I was really sweating. And I, I was listening to some music. And it wasn't even, I mean, I don't think it was devil music, but it wasn't like Christian music. It was, it was in the background. And, I, and then I had a thought that I knew immediately that's God. Sometimes we can have a thought and we're not sure, is that me or is that God? But then there's other times when we have a thought, and maybe you've experienced this, you have a thought that is so different than the normal thoughts that you think that you, you, you come to the conclusion, well, that ain't me. And I don't think I'd have that particular thought from like the devil. I think that's God talking to me. I had one of those thoughts. And here's the thought that I had. While this music is just playing in the background, kind of, kind of a little very soft Charlie Brown teacher voice. That's, I, I wasn't even really listening to the lyrics. I was thinking about the conflict that I was in with these people. And as I was thinking about that, I, I wasn't even aware. I'm ticked off. Now, the, the, the official word for being ticked off is being honked off. And I was honked off. And then I had this thought, and this was the thought. And you can tell me if you think this might be something that God would communicate. This was the thought that came into my mind. Don't demonize any of the good people that you're in conflict with. What? I, can, I could take you to Newburgh, Oregon, right where I was running, right when I had that thought. It was, it was one of the most impressionable experiences I've had in my life with God. And I wish I could always distinguish how quickly something is of God and, and not me or the world. But I knew then, and I, this was my thought, I heard the, this word, this, this thought, don't demonize any of the good people that you're in conflict with. And my first thought was, you're kidding, right? You're absolutely kidding. And then that thought just came back again. Don't demonize any of the good people that you're in conflict with. And I said, after that, I went, not even a little? My parents, I think I wore them out. It's like, just do what I said. Well, I have some questions. I'm an inquisitive guy. Not even a little? But I knew this was the, the Lord God speaking to me in a way that I could understand. Well, that conflict did not get resolved for a long time, not in my life. We moved, and I'm four years down the road from that move, and about four and a half years down the road from that encounter with God where I, had, I knew he was talking to me. 
what I found was the conflict was unresolved regardless of where I was located. We were located hundreds of miles away from the people and the conflict, and yet it was right here and right here. It followed me. And the word never changed. It never changed. I, I don't know if you've found this to be true, but God is pretty resolute when he says something to us. Have you noticed that? Like if you argue with him, he's like, you know what? You've convinced me. I think you're right. I was wrong. I was a little too strong on that. That's not how the Lord works. At least not for me. He's very resolute. There's no shifting shadow with God. He is truth. So when he speaks to you or me in ways that we can understand, whether it's through the scripture or through his spirit speaking to us or through counsel of another person, that is going to be a straight way and a good word. What I learned is that the Lord is patient. He's patient for us to find our way and follow him. I'm so glad that the Lord hasn't given up on me on the myriad of times that I was slow to follow or chose not to follow. Thank you, God, for your patience. Have you been the recipient of God's patience? Well, he helps you to come along and follow him. So I was praying and Diane and I were fasting about should we go? It's not that the Lord wasn't interested in giving us direction. I'm not sure if you are participating in this fast that we've, we've called the church to. And if so, what the Lord might be saying to you or what you're seeking from him. So often I find that it's direction. And it's not that the Lord isn't willing to give us direction. But when our direction takes us away from people that we have unresolved conflict with, the Lord's going to not only want to speak to the direction, but to the conflict for resolution. And what I understood, what I understand now that I didn't then is, this, this is the larger message. Sean, you're beloved to me. And so are they. And you might have in your mind, as I shared that example, think, well, okay, you described the Lord saying, you don't demonize those good people that you're in conflict with. You might say, well, I'm in conflict with people that, that aren't good. But the lesson for me that, that I continue to have to learn is this. God loved me before I loved him. He loved me before I was lovable. Where, where would Sean McNay be if God was waiting for me to get all cleaned up before he loved me? I'd be lost. Utterly lost. I mean, I know how to take a shower and I take one every once in a while. I'm not talking about cleaned up on the outside. I'm talking about cleaned up in my mind and my spirit. The Lord loves us before we're cleaned up. You know why? Because he made us. And he knows without his help, no one is getting cleaned up. So when the Lord said to me, you don't have to be demonize those good people that you're in conflict with. He wasn't talking about whether they were right or wrong. And I asked the Lord, by the way, who's right? Have you ever done that with God? Who's right? Just tell me. And, and of course I thought, of course I know it's me and you, we're right. So just go ahead and confirm that they're wrong. Not once in the years that I was praying did the Lord ever speak to me about the right or the wrong. 
Now, God did give Diane and I some clear direction to follow. But I think what one of the lessons he was teaching me was, Sean, I want your eyes on me, not them, on me. You follow me. So I have a scripture that, it's a story, it's a portion of a story I'd like to read. It's about relationships. It's about God's perspective on people that are different from one another. Not only different, but that they see one another differently. The story happens in the early days of the church. So Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. And in his resurrection, he says to his small group of believers, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait until I send the Holy Spirit to you. They, they didn't truly even understand what that meant, but they did understand go to Jerusalem and wait. So they do. And after he has ascended to heaven, they have an experience of a, the, the, it's called Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit is given to individuals that are following the Lord Jesus. And at that moment where God gives his Holy Spirit to inhabit, not just upon, but in, the church is born. And that, that young church would have been probably in its first decade easily when this story takes place. And the story centers around one of Jesus' closest friends. He was a guy named Peter. Peter, in his previous life, had been a fisherman. And Jesus had called Peter and his brother Andrew and some of their friends and some others to closely follow him. His closest to say, it was a band of about 12 people. There were more than that that followed him. But Peter became not only one of the leaders in the group, but a close, close friend of Jesus. And then he became a, the leader of the church. Well, we find Peter in the early days of the church venturing away from Jerusalem to go visit some of the Christians that had experienced the witness of the, and, and infilling of the Holy Spirit. So he's away from Jerusalem, uh, probably northwest of Jerusalem, in a little place called Lydda. And he goes from there to a town called Joppa. And there's a man named Simon. Simon is a tanner. And Simon and Peter are friends. And Simon, Simon says, hey, you can come and on your travels, if you need a, a home base, you stay with me. So that's where Peter's at. We pick up the story in Acts chapter 10. And it reads like this. Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1. In Caesarea, which is about uh, 30 miles away from Joppa, where Peter's at. Caesarea would have been on the coast. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman officer, a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. So this is interesting. Cornelius isn't a Jew. He's a Roman soldier stationed in what would have been Israel or Palestine. But he is a God-fearing man, which means that he has accepted that the God of the Jews is the real God. And he is a follower of that God. That's what it means here when Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, says he's a God-fearing man. So essentially, he's a Roman converted to, uh, to become a Jew or the follower of the, the Jewish God. It says, one afternoon about three o'clock, he had a vision, that's Cornelius, in which he saw an angel coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. The angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner who lives near the seashore. 
Simon by the seashore. I think that's where that little, you know, and I think he sold seashells, right? Cornelius would have been a, a, a soldier, a leader of soldiers. And he has this vision that's kind of terrifying to him. Like he's being approached by an angel and the angel has a specific word for him. God has heard your prayers and received your offerings. In other words, God knows who you are. By the way, it's with confidence that I say to you this morning, God knows you. He knows who you are. He's intimately acquainted with you. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called his two household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. So there's, this would be an example of, you remember when I said I knew right away that was God talking to me? Not all of the time do I. This would have been one of those moments for Cornelius where he was certain uh, I, that wasn't just the pizza I ate the night before. That was God speaking to me. So he acts on it right away. And he sends some people, go get this guy and here's where he's staying. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. Verse 9, the next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up onto a flat roof to pray. This would have been the, flat, the roof of Simon's house where he was staying. It was about noon and he was hungry. You ever been hungry? Like I'm a little hungry right now, but I'll finish the sermon. Peter is hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. And then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have, and again, okay, just so you know, this would be another example of, it doesn't always happen this way, but Peter knew instantly this wasn't just I'm hungry and I'm thinking about food. He is very aware that something is happening where the Lord is communicating to him. And he replies, no, Lord, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. So we can know, really, it's not just implication, whatever was in that sheet that was let down that the Lord said, it's dinner time. Those were the things that Peter said, those, don't, those aren't appropriate for me. I don't know, Lord, if you know, but I'm a Jew and those aren't appropriate. So he says, no. Which is interesting, those, that phrase together, those two words. No, Lord. If you're going to call someone Lord and you say no, then the, the word Lord maybe doesn't fit. You could say no, sir. No way, Jose. But if you refer to somebody as Lord, what you're saying is you're, you're making a statement of your relationship to them. And if Jesus is Lord, then Peter's relationship to Jesus is one of a surrendered and submitted follower. So the idea of no Lord, is that doesn't work. But Peter isn't trying to just be stubborn. He doesn't understand what's being put before him. And then it goes in verse 15. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. 
The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? You remember when I said I was out running and I, I had this thought and I knew right away it was from God. There's no reason for you to demonize those good people that you're in conflict with. I was really pondering over that. I didn't fully understand all of the implications or what it meant or what it meant for me. And Peter is puzzling. Boy, that sounds like a good tongue twister. 19, meanwhile, as Peter, oh, excuse me, verse 17, Peter was very perplexed. Later, he's going to puzzle. But he was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling, perplexed Peter puzzled over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, I have sent them. So Peter went downstairs and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? Do you think that might not have gotten their attention? Whoa. No wonder Cornelius sent us for this guy. This guy's good. He, we didn't even introduce him. I'm, I'm the guy. You're looking for me. I wonder if he told him. The Holy Spirit told me. I'm not that good. It was, it was the Holy Spirit. He went down. Why have you come? Verse 22. They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He's a devout and God-fearing man. I think they had to add that because they said he's a Roman, right? Because did you know that the Jews and the Romans weren't big fans of one another? They hated one another, despised one another. Uh, we're servants of Cornelius, the Roman officer, God-fearing guy. He's a God-fearing guy. Just so you know, he's not just a Roman, better known probably because he's a God-fearing guy. He's devout, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them accompanied by some of his brothers from Joppa. So Peter the Jew is not just going to hop onto the caravan with a bunch of Romans without having some of his own guys with him. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. It would have been about a 30-mile journey. That's a while on foot or even on donkey. They didn't have Uber and they didn't have Tesla. So it would have taken a while. Maybe even an opportunity to have some conversation. Like, tell me about this Cornelius guy. What was it that, you know? Maybe Peter just stayed with his brothers, the, the Jews that were traveling with him. Or maybe his curiosity, like, what is the Lord up to on this one? Don't know. But it, they wouldn't have gotten there immediately. Verse 25, as Peter entered his home... Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up. I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside. By the way, a Jew going into a Gentile's home, not just a Roman, but to a non-Jew's home, big no-no. Kind of like eating all of those things that were let down in the blanket. They talked together. He went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, 
You know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. This is a guy that knows how to make friends quick, doesn't it? You know I shouldn't be here because you're lowly and I'm not. I shouldn't even be here. By the way, I'm Peter. I just feel, you know, you, that blesses my gizzard that you're just saying I shouldn't even be here with you. You know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. This is interesting. Peter puzzled and Peter was perplexed. And now it's been about a day and he's still been thinking about that. And here he verbalizes to people that it's obvious a Jew should not be hanging out with these folks. And he's come to a conclusion. I think God's talking to me about stuff that doesn't have to do with food. I think it has to do with relationships. And I see people as impure and unclean and God's telling me, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not how I see them. And I, I want you to adopt my ways. And you might think, that's all it took. Peter just needed a little bit of time. And boom, he, he just transitioned over. Oh no, there are some very public times of Peter going back into the old rut back into the old way of seeing people. In fact, the Apostle Paul has to publicly call Peter out a few years later and say, you are disdaining followers of Christ who are Gentile in background, and you're favoring Jewish Christians, Christians who are Jewish in background, you're favoring them, and, and that's not right. You're showing favoritism because someone is ethnically a Jew or religiously a Jew and they've come to follow Christ and you're holding off those who aren't like you and like them. Paul had to publicly confront the leader of the church. Peter didn't just get it overnight. Can I tell you when the Lord said to me, you don't, don't demonize these people that you're in conflict with. I didn't get it overnight. It took me years. It took counsel. It took confrontation. It took conviction. And I think that the Lord was asking me to come to a place of humility. And that's the issue between God and me. My pride. I don't know what it is that might keep you from following the Lord, but oftentimes it's my pride. I remember writing an email to one of the good people that I'd been in conflict with and confessing that I'd held this grudge against them. This was four years later and asking for their forgiveness with not once ever hearing from God who was right, by the way. I still wonder, but I'm pretty sure I'm never gonna, I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna get to heaven and I don't think I'm gonna care about it anymore. I really, you know what? I don't care about it now. And I'm correct, this isn't heaven yet. I'm not in heaven yet, right? The Lord never spoke to me about who was right or wrong. Sometimes there is very clearly some, hey, that, you're, they're in the wrong. But in my case, in that situation, that's not what the Lord spoke about. I wrote an email, and I, I, I have you ever done this? You, you have a letter to send or an, an email to send, and you like, just hit, hit, hit put, push the button, send, hit send. I'm going to say, I don't know if I want to do that. I'm right there. I'll do it with my elbow. 
why, why is it so hard? I finally sent it. I sat on the email for over 24 hours. You know the distance from here to the keyboard? It, it doesn't take 24 hours. But I waited. But it was the death of my pride. And my pride does not want to die. I hit it. And I can tell you, I had a physical feeling like, not that I was levitating, but somebody had taken a pack of 100 pounds of rocks off my shoulder. I literally I took this deep breath. And then I had this thought, why did I wait so long? And the Lord's like, I know, right? Just hit. Yeah. Are, you, are you waiting on something that the Lord has, maybe he hasn't answered all of your questions. But, but your next right step is clear. And let me just say, I, I don't ask the question for condemnation because you're looking at a guy who is just, I just... Four and a half years to go from here to here? But the distance misrepresents the work God was doing in my life. And, and it was after I hit sin that I really began to understand I'm beloved to God and so are they. And if you've been in conflict with someone who's hurt you, let me just say this. I'm not here saying that the things that they said or did were right. Oftentimes, those things that hurt us really are wrong. But I want to remind you of what the Lord brings me back to on a regular basis. Sean, I love you. And I've, I've, I've loved you before you ever came to any conclusions of who I was or that you wanted to follow me. I've loved you from the start. And it wasn't based on you being cleaned up. Now, I'm not saying the way we live doesn't matter. It does. Read the scriptures. The counsel from the Lord and his disciples, it's clear the way we live. And the way we treat one another does matter. But our worth and our value are not in what we do. Our worth and our value are found in who created us. This is such a slow lesson for me to learn that the people that I disagree with, the people that maybe have hurt me, the people who have a, an ideology or a worldview that's a mile and a half down the road from mine, the Lord would say, I love them. They're beloved to me. Diane and I were listening to a uh, podcast, and there was this lady, and she was being interviewed. And she made a statement that was not easy to hear. I mean, I've been wrestling with it. And I thought, well, if I'm wrestling with it, I'm a guy that likes to share. I'd like to share with you the thing I'm wrestling with. And if you can wrestle with it too, great. So that would mean I won't be the only one in misery. <laughs> Welcome to church. Aren't you glad you came? No, this has really been, it's been challenging me. But I think it goes along with this idea when the Lord would say to Peter, don't call things unclean that I've called clean. Don't call something unholy that I'm not saying that's unholy. This is it, the woman, it, her name is Sharon McMahon. She said this, as much as I dislike every idea you may have, underneath your picture is the word beloved. And that rubs so many people the wrong way, and it shouldn't. 
she was talking about in these days of, I, are you aware that um, we're in the year of a general election? I don't know. I, I don't, sorry if I'm ruining your day, but there's a, there's a general election coming up, right? And so we have, have you noticed that people have strong opinions? Uh -huh. And somebody had put out a picture of two candidates who oppose one another, and underneath the picture of both of them was the word beloved. And it just honked off everybody. Because the people who don't think they're beloved think, take that word away. It's okay if they're beloved, but not them. And, and they're like, no, 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 they, they're beloved, but they're not. It can only go under one person's name. <laughs> and when I heard that, I thought, isn't that so much just like the Lord? We want to choose who's beloved based on what we think. And I don't know if you do these mental gymnastics, but I do. I am really good at making sure that the Lord agrees with me. Which is a scary thing, but don't worry. He's the one that's sovereign, not Sean. I don't know if you have people that you'd have a hard time seeing the word beloved under their picture. I'm sure. I'm sure there are some you would place that under their picture. You would say, absolutely, they're beloved. And this takes me to kind of where I'd like to wrap up. Diane and I did follow the Lord. The Lord, we were seeking the Lord for a destination. And that destination ended up being Quincy, Washington. There is such a place. It wasn't that the Lord wasn't interested in helping us take our next right step. But the more important work, really, was the work that was internal for me. Learning a small lesson. I didn't realize I would have to relearn this lesson. I end up in conflict again. He's like, man, Sean, you are really, this is one of the reasons my brother Lindsay called me the pugilistic pastor. Like, yeah, I remember, he, I, I've said this before, when he found out I was going to be a pastor, he's like, you are going to be a pastor? I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? Yeah. You think I'm going to punch somebody? And I'm like, well, I, you know, I know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he just dubbed me the pugilistic pastor. I haven't punched anybody. No. I'm just inclined to put the word beloved under the p picture of, of people that I think. And I think what the Lord's teaching me again is this. I'll lead you. I want you to follow me, and that involves directions. But relationships that are unresolved matter, and they follow us. And where the Lord brings back to is, is my pride getting in the way of me saying who the Lord can love, who the Lord can count as beloved. Now you might hear this and think, yes, Sean, it's important though that we surrender our lives. Absolutely it is. Absolutely. That's the message that the Lord Jesus has given to His church. Invite people to surrender their lives in faith and follow Him. That's the message. So if somebody chooses not to do that, they're no longer beloved? No. The value of the individual comes from the one who made them. This is why I can say at the end of each service, and we're not there, we, we have a beautiful song to sing. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and give to you His peace. 
That's, that's the Lord's desire for his people that he's created, that they would be blessed in him. Lord, thank you for counting me a wayward sheep to be worthy of your love. Thank you for putting up with my pride and not giving up on me and helping me and being patient with me. Lord, I, I can say thank you for your patience with us. Lord, I'm asking that you would help me to see others the way that you see them. And I offer myself, Lord, as a vessel for you to be honored and magnified within that others might see you. Lord, our prayer is that you would be magnified in us, your followers. Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. If you want to stand with us as we close with this prayer, really, that the Lord would be magnified. People would see how, how much he loves us and he loves them. there? Yeah. You're all very kind and patient to have listened to me. I appreciate it. I really do. My hope is that you'll be encouraged to listen for the voice of God who knows how to speak in a way 
that you understand. My hope is that as you listen and discern, you'll follow. He is worthy to be followed. Your job is not to convince somebody else what to think. But if you're willing, you can be used as a vessel, as a mirror, to reflect who Jesus Christ is. And He knows how to draw people in. So, as followers of His, I say to you, the Lord bless you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Follow the Lord as best as you're able with the faith that you have. Set aside pride and follow the Lord. And see if the Lord doesn't use you to attract and draw some others to Himself. So if you would allow me one last time to say the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face, His pleasing, pleasing countenance to shine on you so that you know you are His beloved. And you are. And the Lord give to you His peace. God bless you, friends. Stay the course. Follow Jesus. You're dismissed.